Ventures versus Is It Control? And uh, Luis, you said you you like uh, Gruel's chances here. I do. I think that uh, Gruel is pretty optimized to play against control decks. The the weakest cards in the deck are some things like Rimrock Knight because they die to well things like Cinderclasm, Spike Field Hazard, Burning Hands, Fire Prophecy, Bone Crusher Giant. The list goes on. But if uh, Mahdi can draw a good mix of Idwell Innkeepers and Adventure Creatures, plus things like Asika's Chariot is really problematic for one-for-one -one removal, he can do well. Though, you know, it's no coincidence that Mori is here in our uh, top bracket here, and uh, he's going to be able to, I think, leverage his removal spells quite nicely this game. All right, well, yes, first Sentinel's going to kick things off, and yeah, get in the red zone, says Mahdi Kuisma. Chipping away. And here, Mahdi really has to decide if he wants to commit Rimwalk Rock Knight to the board. Cinderclasm is a scary card, but I think he's probably going to conclude that he just can't really play around all the different removal spells. He's got to just play the cards he's got and uh, kind of see where this ends up. Well, Fire Prophecy is going to take it down, and Mahdi's going to say, you know what, I can live with that. That actually kills a bunch of relevant cards here. But as you see, Noriki Mori with Double Bone Crusher, Burning Hands, Shark Typhoon, and a Maze Mind Tome. If Mori had a third land, he would have definitely cast Bone Crusher Giant and then on, you know, or Stomp on the Rim Rock and then Bone Crusher. But he had to use Fire Prophecy because he really didn't want to risk missing a land drop. So not surprised to see him do that and then leave up the burn crusher because he's not really looking to get on the board he's looking to answer everything Mahdi plays and we're actually seeing kind of the the, the dark side of jesper sentinel we've seen a ton of draws where this card has been key in fact sometimes winning games by letting the player on the draw effectively steal the lead but against a control deck that's killing all your creatures it's one mana one two with no text so far this game Or he just passes the turn back, takes a hit from the Sentinel. Queensman's going to go land into Bone Crusher Giant here. And that's actually going to prompt a Shark Typhoon to get cycled for one. No land drop coming here for Mori, and he'd really like to hit it, and he doesn't. Sees two cards there and just has to pass the turn back with triple Bone Crusher, Mystical Dispute, Burning Hands, and a Maze Mind Tome. Yikes! Yeah, missing a land drop there is huge because now you, he gets to the point where he's really not going to be able to leverage all of these cards. And uh, Mahdi, again, has to decide what to play around because if he just attacks with Bone Crusher on the Shark Blocks, he's opening himself up to a stomp. If he taps out for Goldspan Dragon, he might run into a Dwari Disruption or, in this case, Mystical Dispute. So even though Mori is missing land drops, it's not that easy for Mahdi to decide how to, how to proceed from here. Is there any consideration for Mori here to just play a Bone Crusher? On his turn, he was, you know, Mahdi was tapped out at the time. You could just say, go and have a Bone Crusher. Yeah, it might die, but you could trade it off for the other Bone Crusher giant, right? If he didn't have the Mystical Dispute, I would have been a lot more interested in making that play. But with mm. Dispute, the fact that you can stop an opposing uh, Goldspan Dragon or Sika's Chariot means that I think that I, I'm just going to do what Mori did and just pass with all the mana up. Okay. And he still gets to cast something this turn no matter what, e even if it ends up being something not super great like bone crusher to the face or whatever mori is in a pretty tough spot where even if he draws a land he's still he still doesn't really have like a smooth sequence of plays he needs to draw multiple lands in order to really start getting unloading his hand Mahdi deciding whether he wants to run out a, a, a Rimrock Knight or not, since. Doesn't add much to the board in the face of that shark. Mystical Dispute is really punishing against non-blue decks because Mori can't even play that Maze Mind Tome and keep up Dispute. And he he might need to keep up Dispute here in order to 
to stop a big play. And it looks like he might just be resigning himself to, uh, you know what, if Madi plays something big, I guess I'll just let it resolve. This isn't going to work out terribly for for Mori here, because the Bone Crusher killed the shark. He then Bone Crushes the Rim Rock. But we're we're now getting to the point where there's still only one. Th oh, there's about to be two threats in play. No, the double Bone Crusher is going to be tough. If Mori's going to need to find a land quickly, and that's one of the more painful ones to find. Yeah, this Maze Mind Tome just looks too slow here. Yeah, sure, you find another land. And you can play a Bone Crusher and have access to Burning Hands or Bone Crusher. But now that Mahdi's drawn a sixth land, he doesn't even have to worry about Dwari Disruption. He can just slam the Gold Span Dragon, and that's just going to that's gonna put Mori down to one, facing down a Gold Span Dragon and a Bone Crusher Giant after they trade, plus that Den of the Bugbear at some point is also going to untap. Right. Boy, I keep going back to that turn where Mori missed that land drop after cycling the Shark Typhoon, Luis, and it just feels like he hasn't really had a chance to come back since then. Oh, wow. Mahdi went for a slightly oh. more conservative play here and got his, his den stomped, which is, that's a pretty big swing because now Mori can trade wow. here and if he draws a land, can play Bone Crusher and then have Mystical Dispute up for that for that Goldspan Dragon. <laughs> oh, so tempting. I love his strength. He but he really needs a land. I, I, the, the one thing that's going, that could lead him to, to him taking iteration is he might think that uh, Mahdi doesn't have a big play in hand because last turn he animated the the creature land instead of playing something. But we what we don't what we know and Mori doesn't is if he takes this iteration, it's not going to work out well for him. What discipline play from Mori here. Oh, and he does not get paid off for it. Oh, it's a land, but it's tapped. And he's going to have to play Bone Crusher with Burning Hands available. Oh. And look at that disappointment on Mori's face as Goldspan Dragon hits the battlefield here for Mati Quizma. Oh, it's just heartbreak for Mori. Gonna knock him down to just one life. Oh, that was an untapped land, he says. He he's gonna get another turn at the very least, thanks to the four life from uh, Maze Mind Tome. But this is gonna be tough. He's gonna have to burning hands the Magda here and then hope to draw he's some kind of answer for that dragon. It's a land off the top. He can scry first. Mystical disputes not it. Draw a card with Maze Mind Tome. And let's see what he hits. He can't even look. It's another land. Well, he doesn't have a den back there, right? Mati doesn't? No. So he's technically not dead? Mm, Sika's Chariot's going to really seal the deal yeah. here for, for Mati. And uh, oh, close game hinged on a, you know, it was a tale of missing land drops, of needing untapped lands, and... Now Mahdi, I think, rightfully feels pretty good about the situation. Though Fire Prophecy is actually one of the one of the better cards to draw because it can kill one of the cats, which yeah. makes it so Chariot can't get crude, and then can actually maybe find something else. Let's see what <laughs> let's see what let's see what Mori can come up with here. This just feels like torture for Mori, doesn't it? Cinderclasm. Not quite. And he's gonna have to scoop him up. Mati Quizma picks up game number one. In his qualification here. I, I actually wonder if Mori was just supposed to fire prophecy the dragon there in case he drew exactly oh. Cinder Closet. Wow. Great point. He also maybe had another spike field hazard that could do it. Yeah, I think that there, there's a chance that that would have, would have worked out better. 
Well, it clearly would have worked out better. There's a chance that might have been the play without knowing your top card here. Wow. Noriyuki Mori made it interesting there, but again, you know, he fell just a little bit behind uh, Mati as far as the land situation went, and he was really never able to to feel like he was back to even in that game, let alone ahead at any point. Looks like a tough situation here for Mati Quizma as he looks to the sky on this mulligan decision. Oh, sorry, he's already mulliganed, hasn't he? he he's choosing between Goldspan Dragon and Embercleave. He's definitely not going to put back any of the other five cards. And it's tricky. They're both good in similar situations. Embercleave's a little cheaper, which gives it an edge, I think. But Goldspan's good if you lose, if all your threats get killed. So there's no clear answer to me here. I, I, I lean more in favor of keeping the, the Goldspan Dragon just because games where Goldspan is, are good and Embercleave aren't are the games you you likely need the help in. Games where Embercleave is good, well, usually Goldspan would also have been fine there and or you're winning anyway. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the Embercleave, you know, generally cheaper than Goldspan Dragon. So that would be a consideration. Here we go. Maze Mind Tome on turn two. For, for Mori to kick things off. He's got a good interactive hand here with Expressive Iteration, Fire Prophecy Island, Disdainful Stroke, and then a little awkward at this point, Curabess the Sea God at seven mana in hand doesn't look super great. Oh, no, I, I love seeing Curabess the Sea God right here. This is a game with this iteration and this tome. He's going to hit his land drops. We're seeing a turn seven cure all the way here. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, I, could I interest you in drawing it on turn five <laughs> and well, having something else here? <laughs> Would that, it could, can I get that you would be better, interested? <laughs> but uh, you know what? Mori's got plenty of action here. He's got Fire Prophecy if, you know, if, if this is the, the Bone Crusher turn, which it looks like. He's got Maze Mind Tome activation. Unfortunately, he might actually use Fire Prophecy to put back the Kira Best to see good, but I don't know. I kind of like guaranteeing hmm. you have a finisher on seven. Yeah, we'll let him decide. Here's Lovestruck Beast. A good play here from uh, Mati Quizma, just playing around a Fire Prophecy fairly nicely here because Lovestruck Beast doesn't die to it. Of course, we might end up in the same spot where depending on what he plays pre-combat next turn, the Lovestruck Beast could be stranded without a 1-1. But interesting decision here uh, from Mori deciding whether to hit the books or not. Yeah, it looks like he's going to get some study time in here. Ooh, Ooh he nice tapped his man. That worked out really well for him. He could take out the 1-1, one, one, which leaves the Lovestruck Beast stuck at home, at least temporarily. He draws his card for the turn. It's a Temple of Epiphany, but it looks like he's more interested in casting multiple spells. Well, yeah, if you're, if you're not going to... Hmm, he wants to keep up both Fire Prophecy and Disdainful Stroke here, it looks like. And Maze Mind Tome activation oh, makes that fa sure. fairly cheap to do that. And w what might happen here is Mati goes pre-combat, play Edgewell Innkeeper, play Bone Crusher Giant immediately, so you're guaranteed to get the card off the Innkeeper. And now Mori is going to want to look to see what he draws off Tome to decide what his next play is going to be. But pretty good chance he he fire prophecies hmm. the, uh, the 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 Edgewall innkeeper. innkeeper to prevent the Lovestruck Beast from attacking. Though, funnily enough, seeing that Essence Scatter makes it, makes it, I think, might make him wonder if he should have just done that in response to Edgewall Innkeeper to begin with. Yeah, that's interesting. He'd love to use this Essence Scatter here, but boy, it costs him five damage to do so. He has life total to play with sitting at 16, but, you know, you got to be careful against decks with Goldspan Dragon and Ember Cleave in them. Yeah, he's going to use it. All right, so there goes Essence Scatter. He's going to take five drop down to 11. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, I'm <laughs> not defending Kira, that one. <laughs> that one. That one's easier to uh, make the decision on. Kira Vesta Sea God number two is going to get sent away here. Then Temple of Epiphany is going to hit the battlefield. And there's a land on top. He's getting really close here, Luis. Dwari Disruption in hand as well as Disdainful Stroke or Maze Mind Tome activation. Love this deck. Well, this is where Lovestruck Beast is going to continue to do what Lovestruck Beast does. Making a Heart's Desire 1-1. One, one. It's going to let the first beast attack. And Mori can't counter this. He can't counter a 1-drop right here. So 
he's really going to be unhappy to see uh, this this Hurts desire go on the stack. Yeah, this is really tough for Maury because, you know, he's taken the higher upside line by using the Essence Scatter last turn, but he has exchanged life total for it, and that second copy of Lovestruck Beast means that it's going to go from 5 to 10 damage now that Noriyuki has taken. And there's Dwari Disruption, though, to nab the other Lovestruck Beast. That has to feel good for Mori as he tries to race to Kyuribes' Sea God. And yeah, he needs to start scrying with the Maze Mind Tome here. He finds a, a, a land off of this. And if he can hit one here, which he has, ooh, and there's Cinderclasm to kill the 1 1 also. That and, means and that he, we're going to see Kyuribes' Sea God next turn right on time. Oh, yeah. And he, he basically just kept the cinder class or the, the the scried the mountain on top again just to get another counter on the tome to get access to those four life it's not like he needed right. he even got anything from the scry right he had already put that there with the uh with the temple cinder does a very good job of stopping a love struck beast and this is this is the, the deck going according to plan this turn most likely gets to cinder the one one disdainful stroke whatever of uh, ox or dragon that Mahdi plays and then untap with Kiora Best the Sea God. So it doesn't get a whole lot better than this. Noriyuki Mori perhaps on the uh, verge of, of taking game number two here. If he can just keep this board stable, he's down to six. There's no way around this for Mati, right? Uh, with, the, with the layer, like the Cinderclasm just means that, that Lovestruck Beast will not be attacking. Well... If he really wanted to attack with the the the, the love struck beast, he could go to attacks. Mori would cinderclasm before attackers are declared. After cinderclasm resolves, he can make the hydra the beast into the lair into a one one, and then attack. The thing is, because Mori tapped that tome, that was a really good play. He's at he was effectively at ten, so that wouldn't be lethal. So Mati went for the higher upside play of play the dragon and hope the dragon is good enough. Here we go, Kior Besta Sea God's gonna hit the battlefield after Mori took nothing that turn. Machi Quizma grimaces as he sees the huge 8-8 crack and hit the battlefield, and Mori's gonna have a sip of tea because he feels pretty good from this position. Well, this is this is what we what he's aiming for, and he's at effect of 10. He's got a, an extra card to see off that tome, and he's got lots of lands in play. Plus, one of those lands is a, a Storm Titan's Lair, so a uh, hall of the storm titan rather so it's a it, it effectively is a seven seven so th when mori starts attacking he just like makes no attacks all game when he starts attacking it ends very quickly that's right Well, Ox of Agonis always gives you hope. And that's what Mighty Quisma is going to put. <sighs> maybe I lied here. He finds three lands off of it. The one is Den of the Bugbear. That maybe is a thing. Now we're going to see second chapter here from Curabes' Sea God. That's going to lock down the two creatures on the other side. And then it looks like we're going to go Temple of Epiphany for Noriyuki Mori. And then, hmm, Spike Field Hazard. Not so much. And then he can activate the Maze Mind Tome and try to find something as well as buff up his life total. Looks like he's considering firing up that creature land that you mentioned, Luis, and 15-ing here. Yeah, I'm pretty two lethal threats the next turn, and he's at ten. I, I'm pretty interested in attacking for a lot, but this also gives you a, the ability to draw and do something with the Maze Mind Tome, and then you still have lethal next turn, assuming you you get to attack with both. So kind of the same either way, and of course, Madi <laughs> drew another land. Can't 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 really do a whole lot. Can attack for a bunch with the Lair of the Hydra, but that would just get blocked. So he's got to just keep the lair up, I suppose, and uh, pass the turn. Yeah, just to not die. That's also the the lair of the Hydra is the key card here. That's why Mori hasn't activated the Maze Mind Tome yet and why he's left all his mana available for his own land. Now he can go ahead and activate the Tome, jump up to 10, and even find another card looking for a hard counter of some sort here. And he finds an island. And there's Midnight Clock. 
And what would you like to steal? Any permanent. Can even be the, the land. Is there anything that can interact at this point with the 8-8 the eight, eight and the 7-7? Seven, seven? Umadi does have two different creature lands, so... Oh, he got that den of the he's bugbear, got, didn't he? He's got a den untapped there as well as the lair, so Mori can't go for lethal right out. But it's going to be pretty hard for Mahdi to turn this around, given the, the, the situation. considering taking the Ox of Agonis, though well, he's hovered over all the permanents here. One reason to to take Ox is that you really don't want that one going back into Monty's graveyard, so by taking it, you don't have to deal with it uh, as an attacker. The Lovestruck mm. Beast can't attack right now, and Mori basically just has to to play a little conservatively here to make sure he doesn't die to some weird Goldfan Ember Cleave nonsense. Though at this point, with Mahdi having played no spells in the past couple of turns, I'm kind of putting him on Ember Cleave and, and all lands in hand. You don't know that he's Ember Cleave, of course, but there aren't very many cards he could have that he wouldn't play. And of course, the truth is he's got all lands, but you, you can't really assume that. Mori is now debating on whether to fire up his creature land and get in. For the full amount. No, he's just going to go for eight here and set up any creature hitting the next turn. Well, as it stands, this den of the bugbear is going to jump in front. So 12 will be Monte Quisma's life total going forward. But uh, Mori can actually play the Midnight Clock and still activate the creature land as a defensive card here. So instead, he gets to start ticking up <laughs> another land off the top of the library here for Monte Quisma. And his deck just has not cooperated here in the late game. Four Not lands in hand. Wow. <laughs> We're also going to see Mori ticking up that clock. Tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> Absolutely. And it actually does go up pretty quickly if your opponent isn't able to force you to cast anything. And here we go. It's already up to four. Another land off the top here for Mori. This is just Mori being very careful, right, Luis? Like, he, he knows he's in a commanding position, but just wants to make sure he doesn't open the door for, like you mentioned, an Ember Cleave hit or something weird like that. Definitely. You you have to play well in the games where you're winning as well as the games where you're losing. And Mori is ahead enough that he doesn't need to be, like, attacking with that 7-7 seven, seven land every turn. In fact, he declines to attack with the 8-8. Eight, eight. Now he's kind of all in on Midnight Clock. The reason is... Lair of the Hydra plus Lovestruck could double block there, and you'd effectively be trading your 8-8 for one of those two. Not a very good deal, especially since that 8-8 is an amazing defender. And with Midnight Clock already up to five counters, Mori's just going to, you know, be like, all right, well, I made some attacks, but now I want a new hand. Yeah, he figures if that Midnight Clock chimes its uh, its bells, he's going to be able to find the win quite easily with a, a fresh hand of seven cards. And it's hard to disagree with him on that. Bone Crusher Giant does put Ox of Agonis back into Monte Quisma's graveyard, as well as add an additional 4-3 to the board. But here we go. Midnight Clock, it's time to charge up. Going up to 7, going up to 8. And it'll have to stay there until the upkeep now it goes up to 9. <laughs> now he finds one of his best top decks here as well with Expressive Iteration. Wow, burning hands in a hand and then just a couple of lands. So an answer for the Lovestruck Beast. But beyond that, not particularly exciting. I think he's going to look and see now if there's still a double block available with one of those layers. And decides just to pass the turn back here. Up to 10 goes the clock. Shatter Skull Smashing can't target the 8-8. It does have Hexproof, so... Mari might be in a position he could attack with a really big Lair of the Hydra, but then we'd run into kind of the same position in reverse where Hall, <laughs> the Hall of the Storm Giants plus the 8-8 the eight eight Kraken can double block the Lair of the Hydra, and all of a sudden that that's a that's a that's a good trade for for uh, Mori. <laughs> but Mori still might be better than able to close this thing out, has he, Louise? I think that clock is going to do it. I think it, it, it allowed Mori the ability to shift into a new plan. And 
I do like this play from Mahdi, especially since you really want to get cards in your graveyard to to make uh, the ox into something. Oh, interesting. He's going to uh, make a 1-1 one, one layer so that his 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 lovestruck beast can attack. He just wants to throw that in the graveyard? Or, yeah. Four? Or, yeah, maybe, maybe he wants to, like, bluff an ember cleave because that would... uh. That would work out, but uh, especially with burning hands on Mori's side, I don't think that he's going to worry too much. <laughs> the lair is going <laughs> to get in. He just wants it in his graveyard. Well, if you wanted that, you could just activate it for zero, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this one really puts Mori to the test, right? Mori passes the test, blocks. And it looks like the ox is still not online, though. Oh, apparently X can't be zero with the land. <laughs> and look at so, that. He well, X can be zero on Shatter Skull Smashing Luis, which is what he just cast it for. And then now the ox comes out after throwing away two cards into the graveyard. Right. Not where you want to be, but Quizm is in desperation mode. And he has built up a board here. He finds <laughs> wow, two more lands. But he has spare a sentinel also. But this is now where the midnight clock becomes a thing. Oh yeah, the clock is going off here. It's already on 10. He's got plenty of mana here. So there's 11. And ding dong. Seven fresh cards going into hand. Well, four of them are lands. No, this is still going to be, I think, enough, especially given the creature land on, on Mori's side. Okay. Like, he can fire Prophecy, one of the, the X3s, to find a new card, use Burning Hand, Cinderclasm. He can kill all of the stuff Mahdi has in play. Okay, Fire Prophecy, maybe to upgrade one of these lands, get rid of a Bone Crusher. And he finds Essence Scatter. And Juari Disruption. For really not, not that impressive for a seven-card hand, but I, again, still think it's going to be enough here. Does look like it. Field of Ruin here can help him breathe easy as well. Is it time to start attacking yet for Mori? I, I I do like getting a move on now that you don't have the clock out. You're not really getting an advantage turn over turn. So Essence Scatter is nice, I suppose, but it would be nice to start be making some forward progress here. Instead, he's just going to pass the turn back over to, to Monte Quizma. He's going to play another layer. He's drawn a Rimrock Knight for the turn. And Mori's considering using his... Uh, field here so part of the reason to, to wait on field is it, it makes Mahdi commit to making a giant layer of the hydra before you use the field so definitely something to consider especially given that Mahdi has two layers in play the cinder clasm could take out the uh, sentinel well the combination of cinder clasm and uh Burning Hands could take out both. You Burning Hands the Ox, then you Cinderclasm. But you know what? No, no, let's, let's slow things down. No no reason to do that if you've got another Midnight Clock. All right, let's just uh, let's sit back. <laughs> let's, start, let's start ratcheting up the clock, and let's draw seven new cards. Let's see what, if those have some more action. <laughs> oh, man. Maury, Maury, you know, you were saying, look, there's no clock anymore uh, on the battlefield. You might as well start putting some pressure on your opponent. Well, he just got his uh, his green light to sit back for even longer. A second copy of Midnight Clock is going to start ticking ever upwards here as on the end step we see him dump three more activations into it. It's already up to four, and it just hit the battlefield this last turn. Now it's at five. There's Disdainful Stroke. That's really the insurance plan here for <laughs> Mori as that takes care of any of the really scary things like dragons and cleaves. Oh, yeah. M Mori's in his wheelhouse now. He's like, yep, I'm just going to sit here on this Midnight Clock and... We'll trade off some cards again, and then we'll see what happens. 
Edgeball Innkeeper was a draw here for Quizma that could let him draw an extra card from Rimrock Knight if he wants to cast both right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say this clock is broken, but it certainly was right twice in this game. <laughs> <laughs> Both hands line up at 12, and <laughs> bad things happen here for Quizma. Good news for, for Mati. Um, he's up a game. So, assuming that he can't find his way back in this particular game, which looks very unlikely at this point, there's the layer going to eight, but as you mentioned, the the field is able to handle that. Then uh, we'll, we'll play game three. Forcing uh, Mori here to use the the field is what Mati's trying to do, but we could actually see burning hands on the lair followed by a cinderclasm for two, wiping out the lair and the two smaller creatures. And there's a field. I kind of liked your line there, Louise. Yeah, they're, 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 they both kind of get the job done. I think at this point, it's actually going to work out fine to to Cinderclasm here. You know you know that Mahdi has one card in hand and probably is an adventure creature, so you definitely could Essence Scatter here, but you're going to get kind of going to get the card back on Cinderclasm, so it might not be bad just to do that. Magda plus Draga, or excuse me, plus Yespera Sentinel is going to make a treasure to get this Rimrock Knight on the stack, and that's going to be a card going into hand here for Mati. So this is a kind of unfortunate situation for Mori, because now that Mati is, is tapped out and everything's in play, he actually has no excuse not to go for lethal, <laughs> but he's really not going to get to use full value out of that last midnight clock there. <laughs> Here's Cinder Clasm to wipe away everything except for the ox, and the ox is going to die here as well. And now Mori knows with a completely tapped out hellbent opponent, he has the win in hand here. He can attack for 15 thanks to his Hall of the Storm Giants, and in they come. Game number two goes to Noriyuki Mori. Yes, he can breathe a sigh of relief finally. And we're going to do the same. We're going to take a short break when we come back. We'll have uh, the deciding game between Mati Kuzma and Noriyuki Mori. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back to coverage here at the uh, Challenger Gauntlet. We are in a qualification match here between Monty Quizma and Noriyuki Mori. If you're just joining us, thank you so much for coming along. I'm Marshall Secliff. I'm with Luis Scott Vargas, and we've got a game three coming up. This is Is It Control in the hands of Mori. Quizma has brought Gruel Adventures and had to really just sit through a, a torture fest there in uh, in game number two. But game number one was, was really nice for Monty. We saw Mori miss a land drop. And Mati really never took his foot off the pedal from that moment, was able to cruise to victory. Now, though, it's all on the line. We've got one game. And at the end of that game, one of these players will be about $50,000 richer. They'll have a seat in the World Championship, and they'll also be in the MPL. And the other one will have to gather their uh, their wits about them to uh, play another match for that same, for those same stakes. They These two players have joined an elite list of players who have ever played a match for this high of stakes, in fact, I think that you have to make like the finals of a pro tour before that becomes true. 
Mm-hmm. So impressive stuff on both sides. Uh, Madi did have to kick things off with a mulligan. A two-lander was not going to get it, the job done. And Mori has kind of the, the the perfect setup for what his deck wants to open on, which is Spike Field Hazard, Spike Field Hazard, Fire Prophecy. Let's hope to draw a mix of land and spells afterwards. Absolutely, and that lines up beautifully against what Mati has here with Magda and Edgewell Innkeeper as the first two creatures, both hazardable. Yikes. And he's also on a mulligan, as you mentioned, Luis. He's deciding what to put back here. Pretty tough. The inclination would be to put like a smashing or one of the black-green pathways. Really hard to put back any of the any of the actual spells. Okay, there's Edgewall Innkeeper. First card on the battlefield, and it's going to stay there for about half a turn as Spikefield Hazard off of a mountain is going to send it packing. That's exactly what Mori wants to see. Now there's Magda, and he's got the other spike field hazard. Wow, even Cinderclasm here as well. It, it's kind of funny if uh, if you're Mori, you, you you feel a little disappointed. You realize you could have uh, you could have got, got him picked both. up a nice two for one off Cinderclasm, and it would have been interesting to see what Mori would have done if that Cinderclasm was in his opening hand. But even seeing it now, I think that you're still pretty happy to to get Magda off the board. That's right. So Spike Field Hazard's going to hit that, and that Cinderclasm's just going to have to sit in hand. Maybe that's something you could discard to fire Prophecy down the line if it doesn't seem relevant at the moment. Well, what, what this is going to come down to early is, can Mori find a counterspell for that Ox of Agonis? Because Ox of Agonis is going to really get Mahdi right back into this game if he just basically goes, trade one for one, trade one for one, play Ox on turn five. It's going to make all these fire Prophecies and Cinderclasms look a lot less impressive. So it was Heart's Desire there for Monte Quisma before passing the turn back. He's going to chip in with a token, kind of ask the question of Mori, do you want to deal with this or take a damage? And Mori says, I'll take the hit. Thank you. And Lovestruck Beast is going to go right on the stack. Now we're going to see Stomp hit the token, which is going to take the Lovestruck Beast out of the equation, at least temporarily. Taking a look at Monty's hand, we can see it's going to take it out of the equation for good, at least for the moment. And there's a land off the top of the library here for Quizma. So that Lovestruck Beast is going to be stuck at home. Yeah, but he's going to get to resolve Ox Vagonis if he goes for it. Obviously, you're not really happy to do that against a deck full of Droid Disruptions and Disdainful Strokes, but your alternative of playing Rimrock Knight is so weak that I I think that, you know, Mahdi's just kind of kind of got a grin and bear it. You already mulliganed. It's not getting better from here. You don't even have a six land if you were to wait a turn. So... Well, just, just go for that ox. You can see the the pain on his face here. This, these, these are really tough matches here for Monty. He has not ran particularly well. The first game went well for him, but boy, that flood in the second game, and he's mulliganed the last two games as well. And it looks, Luis, like he's going to take the more conservative route here and go for the Rimrock Knight first. And now are we going to see Cinderclasm from Mori? Is is three power enough? He doesn't really want to use Cinderclasm while there's still that Lovestruck Beast on the table and threatening an attack. Plus, he could, you know, at some point set up Cinderclasm plus Fire Prophecy on the, the Lovestruck Beast to take that down. Okay, well, he's content to just take the three damage here, it looks like. Rimrock Knight gets through as... Mori cast a Maze Mind Tome. Here's Asika's Chariot. Oh, yeah, we're going to see a Cinderclasm for sure here. Right. Now Cinderclasm looks great. It gets to take out three creatures from the battlefield. No counterspells yet for Mori. He hasn't drawn them, but he's had onboard answers. He finds another mountain off the top of the library, and the pressure on this Maze Mind Tome is starting to mount. Here, though, he can just crash, uh, cast Bone Crusher Giant, leave up Fire Prophecy or the Tome, pass the turn back. There it is. Ox of Agonis goes on the stack, and it's going to resolve here for Monte Quizma. He needs to hit well. Yeah. 
Does that count? He found Shatter Skull Smashing, which is an answer for Bone Crusher and his own Bone Crusher. Yeah, it's not the best, but you know, you, you're you're only drawing three cards. You're not drawing seven, so <laughs> you know it's no midnight clock. <laughs> I mean, even the Maze Mind Tome gets more than that. Okay, Asika's Chariot's going to get activated by this Ox, mainly just because uh, it doesn't have summoning sickness and he can just send it in. There's no copying that's going to happen here, however. Ooh, <laughs> Best the Sea God off the top. That comes from the Maze Mind Tome. And with a land in hand, that's coming down next turn, the perfect draw. Oh, there we go. I mean, everything went according to plan. Turn one, kill a creature. Turn two, kill a creature. Turn three, kill a creature. Turn seven, cure a best to see God. Unbelievable top deck there for Mori. He has crafted this hand, and it's beauty for him. He's got the 8-8 Kraken on the battlefield. That's going to be bigger than anything else. And he's really put Monte Quisma in a tough position here. With just Ox of Agonis as an attacker, I guess he does have a Den of the Bugbear back there somewhere as well. 16 life for Mori. He also has Maze Mind Tome on two counters. So a very safe life total here. And this is just going to put him in a spot where Mari's going to need an Ember Cleave to, to get by that 8-8, and there, there appear to be none in sight here. Fire Prophecy, River Glide Pathway are the last two cards in hand for Mori, but he has Maze Mind Tome with only two counters on it. He's going to generate card advantage from Curabes' Sea God as well. And look at this, Den of the Bugbear is going to get fired up. And he can just send these in, get in for a little bit of damage, and critically make a 1-1 to maybe wake up the beast next turn. And it looks like Mori's going to take an additional damage here by blocking the bugbear rather than the ox. Doesn't necessarily want that going to the graveyard. There is already one there, but still, it's an additional card. Curabus the Sea God, Chapter 2, is going to lock down the creatures on the other side. And wow, there's Field of Ruin as well. And look at this. Hall of Storm Giants is going to get fired up here because... There's no attackers on the other side. So he can crunch for 15 and have two lethal attackers next turn. And at 11 life, there's just nothing that Quizma can draw here, right? I don't really think so. He doesn't have any untapped creatures, so it's not like he can Ember Cleave. Drawing a gold span is not going to do it. He doesn't have any blockers. He can play a Bone Crusher, but that can get stolen by Kiora Best the Sea God or killed by Fire Prophecy. And I think that Kiora Best the Sea God, it's going to deliver Noriyuki Mori a world's invite. Unbelievable performance by Nori Noriyuki Mori. This tournament makes his way to the Challengers Gauntlet after having only been playing Magic for the last couple of years. He started in 2019, but he has played by a, like over double more matches than anybody else in the field. And now he has found himself a world championship seat. What an accomplishment! for Noriyuki Mori, and Luis, he did it in style. He did it with his 